I've left my email address on the slide so that if you want to contact me afterwards because you're too embarrassed to ask a question at the end of the talk, that's fine. I'm going to um, look at an issue which I think is quite relevant today, particularly relevant today, because um, yet again there's um, another news announcement about embryology, uh, which you probably will have read in the newspapers, which kind of typifies some of my concern about the way we, um, we tend to portray science. It's really quite extraordinary to consider that the furore of the MMR vaccine resulted in a massive drop in the number of people being, another kids being vaccinated in Britain. For example, in Liverpool, parts of inner city, London, some parts of Manchester, parts of Birmingham, Sheffield and so on. Uh, immunisation dropped to around 70%. Uh, at the level where you might have um, epidemics. And indeed, of course, there have been uh, outbreaks of measles. There's no question that some babies would have been brain damaged in consequence. I don't think there have been any deaths. But the responsibility uh, of, um, of the way we handled that problem, I think, is quite clear. Now, of course, it's clear that the press, particularly the Daily Express and the Daily Mail, have much to answer for, not least uh, my friend Melanie Phillips, who of course continued to conduct a vigorous anti-science campaign in the newspapers, uh, refusing to accept the fact that Andrew Wakefield had published in a way which I think we now accept was dishonest. Uh, indeed, he's now reaping um, the consequences of his publication uh, and his uh, lack of uh, declaration of financial interests in what he was doing. But I don't think that that actually is the fundamental problem. And it's very, very easy to blame the newspapers, which is what we tend to do, or uh, an individual doctor who appears to have been dishonest, or indeed uh, journalists like Melanie Phillips who are rather bizarre in the way they behave. I think we should be looking more at ourselves. And the interesting thing for me is that we had great experts in the measles vaccine, people like um, Liz Miller, for example, from the Public Health Laboratory Service, coming on and saying that the vaccine was safe and repeating this again and again. But the fact was that this was not trusted by the public. And the interesting question is why? And I think we didn't actually listen to those members of the public as scientists. And if you think about it, the ethical responsibility for a mother with a child a year old is very clear. That child's health is of paramount importance. The safety of that child is critical. And therefore, for the mother, her ethical responsibility is to make certain that the child is not endangered. So to receive a vaccine which might cause danger is actually a, a very critical question. And the people who are refusing the vaccine are not being irresponsible. They're actually, in a way, being responsible. And what we failed to understand was that the ideal solution for any mother is for there to be herd immunity, that is, everybody else to be vaccinated, but not uh, her child itself or himself or herself. What we have failed to do as scientists, and I know that most of you are in science and technology this morning, which is why I'm saying this, is that if technology is to be trusted, then we actually have to look very carefully at how we portray technology. And that's why I think the announcement of the uh, DNA um, mixture in the embryos from Newcastle University this morning, and I'm sorry if somebody from the University of Newcastle is here, is actually an irresponsible um, announcement. Not least because actually it's not been through peer review journal process. As far as I understand, this is not the result of a published paper, though I may be wrong about that. I just tried to ring the Times just now to confirm, but Mark Henderson hasn't rung back. But I couldn't find any reference to it in the literature. Maybe there's something coming out tomorrow. Quite a number of journals like Nature are published on Friday. But I think it's unlikely that it is published, and therefore it hasn't really been evaluated. And actually, of course, it isn't new anyway, because People have been doing those sorts of experiments with mitochondria, not least in my own laboratory. Not that I'm, this is not out of jealousy, by the way. I'm, don't, I'm delighted if Newcastle produce a baby which has got um, 
that is devoid of a defect. But it's a matter of objectivity, that really I'm not convinced that this kind of hype is actually helpful to science. Now, we need to go back to the British Museum. If you go to the museum, there's this very famous um, stone uh, flint hand axe, um, which has been dated what, about one and a half million years old. Notice it's uh, 1.5 million, million years BP. BP stands for before present. Actually, interestingly, BP is not the year 2010. That's not the present for the purposes of, of dating because most archaeological dating is done on the basis of radioisotopes, in particular the decay of carbon-14, as you know, to carbon-12, um, and that's a half-life of about five and a half, 5.7 thousand years. My point is that the interesting thing is that before present refers to, roughly speaking, about 1950. And the reason for that, of course, is that that's when we started to do uh, hydrogen bomb testing in the Earth's environment and therefore contaminated our environment with radioisotopes which hadn't been there previously and made modern carbon uh, radio dating rather awkward. An interesting point. This beautiful object, which is about one and a half million years old, is interestingly identical to this hand axe, which is only about 200,000 years old in the same museum from Boxgrove. And the interesting thing, of course, well, certainly to me, I hope to you too, is that in a million years, the technology has not changed. It's the same shape, same size, same way of working the flint. And although the pre-human brain is developing, there's been no evidence, really, of any innovation in a million years. And yet, of course, it's the stone hand axe which actually separates us from other species. That's the key event, I think, in our developmental history, in my view. And the reason why I say that, of course, is because, as far as we know, the human brain expanded massively over two, three million years. Um, we can go to this photograph. On my, in my left hand, I've got um, a made-up skull of Australopithecus afarensis with a cranial capacity of about 450 milliliters. And in my right hand, I've got a made-up skull of Homo erectus, which in the space of about a million years has doubled its brain size. And there are many theories about why brain size rapidly developed in this way, but it's very probable that cessation of vegetarianism was a major factor because, of course, as you will know, our brain is about 70 to 80 percent lipid, it's fat, and that fat is most easily derived from animal sources. And secondly, of course, in order to scavenge, but particularly to hunt, I mean, to scavenge you need a hand axe, but to hunt you need a hand axe and something else. You need to be able to communicate. The notion that you could, ha you could hunt an animal single-handed, of course, in the wild is a nonsense. And according to Robin Dunbar from Oxford University, the probability was that uh, early pre-humans, uh,